So um, to motivate my talk, I can say I'm going to try and do basically, in the way it's the same as what Andres was trying to do. So we have to um, convince a lot of people also outside this room that the major problem of underlying all the different crises that we are experiencing right now is actually a philosophical problem. It's got something to do with our attitude towards the world, our machine view of the world. I'm writing a book about this right now that is, um, it's, yeah, it's aimed at a general audience, but I guess the general audience that writes, uh, reads these kind of books is always scientists, philosophers, and, and uh, science journalists, and nobody else. But I think it's a really important uh, uh, topic that we have to try and translate. And I think Andreas uh, presented a very interesting way in communicating to a certain segment of the, the population. Now I'm trying to address people who consider themselves pretty hardcore, you know, rigorous. They wouldn't like the term love. Don't forget that I try to address the same people. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying it in a little bit of a complimentary way, let's say, to, to Andres. So what I'm trying to do here is pretty much the same that Andres was trying to do, but I'm trying to formalize the shit out of everything and see how far I can take this approach until it breaks. OK, so it's really kind of <laughs> exactly the opposite of what uh, Andres was trying to do. So, um, and I want to um, represent one of the researchers um, uh, in theory of life that is uh, often a bit of a controversial figure, uh, Robert Rosen and, and his ideas. And one of the reasons, uh, first of all, I think he has a bunch of concepts that are really useful here. And, and second, of course, I think Rosen's work is a lot about the limits of formalization, which is not often recognized. And so I want to present to you a perspective on Rosen that focuses on this part of his work. So here's the outline. Since this meeting is about normativity, I'm going to talk to the topic. My basic questions are pretty broad. Where do norms come from? And I mean, where do they originate in the universe? When is the first time in the universe that a normative uh, sort of uh, phenomenon comes into play? And what the hell are they? And we've heard some interesting ideas already. And a lot of philosophical confusion. Are they materialist? Uh, this is, it's great to follow up on Charles because he's done a lot of the homework uh, there for me that um, I don't even know about. So this was really interesting. And I'm looking forward to reading your paper uh, in the future. And why is this important? OK, so what I'm going to try to do is, is have some very preliminary thoughts about what I would call a naturalist account. I don't know, Alejandro, if you, <laughs> you will agree. If, uh, I may get in trouble here of organismic normative realism, OK? So I don't want to talk about values, because I, I think values are very, have this strong connotation of, human, of the human context, OK? So we want to talk about norms, um, because they're much broader than values. And um, I want to introduce this Rosenian uh, concept of imminent causation that's introduced in life itself that leads to organizational continuity, so a processual view of uh, the organization the organism. That's very important that that, in my view, is at the root of agency and normativity. And it's intrinsically and intricately, uh, uh, inextricably, ah, sorry, I also have uh, the pork problem that Charles was suffering uh, from before, uh, have to do with the problem of embodiment. The problem of, of emb embodiment is really interesting. If you read all these organizational theories, uh, papers, uh, you know, from the, the San Sebastian uh, Paris group, uh, different uh, groups, um, not you, <laughs> uh, or Ezekiel, because it's all, there it's all about embodiment. But if you have these, these papers about, you know, that show you the, the, the abstract diagrams of organization, there's always a little paragraph in the paper that says, oh, and then this needs to be embodied somehow, right? But there's always a very short paragraph. And then we go on, right? But the problem of embodiment itself is a really important problem, OK? So there's a very um, important difference between an abstract representation of an organism and an organism, OK? This seems obvious, but I, I just want to talk about this as well. And then maybe um, a bit controversially, I would like to argue that survivability is really the basic uh, norm that organisms have and have to have to survive, obviously, <laughs> by definition, and that you can only get other norms evolving from that. And that um, this survivability is a norm that is a prerequisite for evolution, so you cannot explain it by evolution itself, so, because evolution only happens once you have it. Okay, that's the plan. And uh, feel free to, if there are questions about understanding, please uh, feel free to interrupt me, actually, during this talk. 
Okay, so I think the broader motivation for the work I'm doing here, and I think that actually I'm really thankful for the organizers here to make me think about normativity a little more, is we live in the most demented of times, okay? I think we can, we can truly say that. It's really interesting. We have more knowledge than we uh, ever had, but I have, um, in biology, I'm a biologist, I have claimed several times that we understand life less than we ever have in human history, okay? Because, despite all our knowledge, we misunderstand life in a way today that we have never misunderstood it before in the whole history of humanity, okay? So to think that living organisms are automata or machines is so wrong that it's even wronger, if that's a word, than uh, original animistic versions of, 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 of the view of nature. Okay, this is this may be a little controversial, but um, here it is. So the other thing that's really demented in our times is we live in this this sort of area era of postmodernity where everybody's entitled to their opinion apparently. So uh, people like uh, people who call themselves philosophers, like uh, certain David uh, uh, Chalmers, write a book like Reality Plus, where he claims that virtual reality is as real as real reality, which is, it's so, it's first of all, it's just populism, right? He panders to a certain idiotic segment of, of, of the population. And second, man, the difference is very simple. Real reality is what kills you when you ignore it, okay? Virtual reality, you just switch it off. There's an, there's an off button, you put the phone away. You go outside, you experience the butterfly, there you are, okay? So we live in this, in this time of maximum confusion, okay? So anybody can just say something about the world without any uh, rhyme or reason, and it's taken serious at the moment. So it norms, just like facts. But the problem is that, you know, postmodernity, with its criticism, has shown us that norms, just like facts, are neither subjective nor objective, but are transjective. This is basically saying the same as Charles was saying about Wexpill before, the umwelt only exists in the, interact, uh, in the interaction of the, the organism with the environment. So, the umgebung. So, basically, it's the same thing. So, we cannot say it's subjective or objective. So, uh, my co-author, uh, John Ravecki, has introduced this word, transjective. So, it's an att attribute of the interaction between the organism and the environment itself. This is really no problem if you uh, subscribe to, to some process uh, uh, ontology and not think about the organism as a thing, okay? It's an interaction, it can ground something. It's okay to do that, it's a process. Norms, just like facts, uh, and this is a claim that we make in a recent paper, are grounded in what we call relevance realization. And again, this has echoes in a, a lot of the, the, the concepts that we've heard about, the historical concepts that we've heard about before. So relevance realization is this process by which the organism picks out those elements of the environment that are actually relevant to its survival. And Charles was talking about this just before. The, the claim, I'm gonna summarize this paper in one sentence, is that this is not, and it cannot be, an algorithmic and therefore a mechanistic process. There is no algorithmic solution to this problem because you cannot define a search space. Okay, so the, the, the central point is here, the, the, the realization of relevance, this is the basic activity of what organisms do, cannot be formalized. Formalized in the sense, uh, strict sense of, of Hilbert, you cannot get rid of the semantic residue of what the organism is about and translate that into pure syntax. So just a bunch of symbols with formal interactions. This is something that is almost impossible to swallow for a lot of uh, my biologist colleagues who are mostly mechanicists and uh, some are computationalists. I think Mike Levin's name was mentioned before. Completely deluded, absolutely strange, um, really, really wrong-headed philosophy. Um, and this is very confused. So we. We build fancy things like clockworks in the 17th century and then suddenly think the world is a clockwork. And now we build computers. Now we think the world is a computer. And worse than that, we think we always thought this way and this is the only rational way of seeing the world. It's completely bizarre, okay? So you have to turn this argument around when you, when you have a public de debate about this and say, 
This is something that only arose in the last 30 years and it's completely upside down, okay? No, the world is not a computer. It's not even like a computer. It's not a mechanism. It's not even like a mechanism at all. And my aim is um, to argue in a, like a little paradoxical, in a formalistic way, as formalistic as possible, show that this is, is, is the case. So I want to use formalism and I want to push the boundaries of the formal approach so far until it shows you that you can take it no further in the context of organisms. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is, I actually got money for this. I told the, <laughs> the Templeton Foundation we're going to break formalism and they, they gave me money for it. So we, this is what we're currently doing. Okay, so that's the plan. So again, relevance realization is the key activity that distinguishes living from non-living systems. A bacterium can do it. The most sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithm that we will build, build in an algorithmic framework cannot do it and will never be able to do it. Um, I've published this uh, argument and upset those three people who read, read the paper uh, with the argument in it, actually, very much. Okay, so this is a fundamental distinction between living and non-living systems. And so the central argument of the talk is very simple. So if the most simple living organism can perform relevance realization, is a process of relevance realization, in fact, because life is grounded in a specific organismic organization, you get for free agency through autonomy, self-determination, self-sufficiency. Eventually, I, I put a bunch of errors in there because there's a lot of <clears throat> gaps <laughs> in our knowledge there, so lead to some kind of, not libertarian, but, but you know, the kind of human free will that is de defensible. And I would argue here, just like that, we can argue that, that norms lead up to, to human values, but even a bacterium has norms, okay? Very basic norms, and there's nothing magic about this. So the account that I will present is what I call naturalist, I, I will see what I can if he agrees, and uh, materialist, uh, I think, as well. So there's nothing, there's no magic. It's emergentist, though. So basically, this is an attempt at a non naive uh, kind of moral and agential realism. Okay, so, so agency and um, norms are real. And they are not real in the classic sense. They're not like facts, classical, uh, causal explanations, but they are real in a different sense that I, I will try to make sense of here. Okay? And I will lean, as I said, on Robert Rosen's work, especially on his main opus, Life Itself, but also a little bit on the anticipatory systems that's been reissued, fortunately, in 2012. Both books uh, highly recommended, but hard to read. Um, and uh, his student, Aloysius Louis, who wrote a series of books that explicate formalisms, uh, especially uh, his middle book, The Reflection of Life, which deals with this idea of imminent causation that I will present to you. So the basic idea is that uh, normativity, meaning, agency, free will in the end, they are not a question of the absence of causation, but they are a peculiar uh, circular self-referential causal regime that you know, underlies it and produces it. They are grounded in that regime. They are not that regime. Um, and last but not least, I want to point out uh, the really important work by uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Janni Hofmeier, um, who is a biochemist, a retired biochemist, and has written a, a wonderful series of papers, also very hard to read, but <laughs> really worth the time. And I'm going to focus on the last one. What he does is he uh, completes Rosen's formalism and adapts it to an actual model of itself. Okay, so the problem with Rosen's model, and one of the main criticisms uh, of Rosen was that his um, model doesn't, doesn't actually connect to biology, and that is an, an accurate criticism, and this is solved by Hofmeier's um, formalism, which also introduces, uh, reintroduces formal cause into the formalism and thereby opens it to evolutionary perspectives. And so this is one criticism of Rosen is that it doesn't connect to actual biology. The second criticism of Rosen is, is often that he's seen as a, almost like a mathematical Platonist, like someone who's a fetishist about uh, formalism and abstraction. But uh, I would argue that this is not actually the case. And 
even if Rosen himself may not have thought exactly in these terms, like I'm going to interpret him, you can easily read him as a perspectival realist. Okay? And this is grounded in Rosen's fundamental concept of the uh, modeling relation that I'm showing here. So his epistemology, which he presents in anticipatory systems, I'm going to explain it a little more afterwards, but uh, I'm just going to introduce it here, is based on this idea that there are natural systems out there that you can somehow characterize by formal systems. And doing science, what he calls uh, natural law, is actually bringing a formal system into some kind of congruence with the natural system. Unfortunately, he isn't very clear about what congruence means. Okay? And so many people have interpreted this as some sort of naive uh, isomorphism between those models. So the idea that the, the cause, what he calls causal entailment in nature is actually is the same as inferential entailment in their logical models. But that is not true. Rosen thinks that, um, and he explicitly says this, and he calls it the art of modeling. He says to produce a formal system is an art. It's not a science. It's not even a craft. It's an art. Because you have to come up with the re relevant uh, variables of the system. Okay, so this is a, a problem of relevance realization. He explicitly says this in both anticipatory systems and life itself. It's not science, it's art. And when you deal with complex systems, one of Rosen's central arguments is a bit confusingly formulated that there is no largest model of a complex system. So basically he says, and this is very Wimsatkin, Bill Wimsat's uh, uh, kind of um, perspectival realism, that complex systems have an indefinite number of models that are not necessarily adding up to a common largest model of the system. So what this is, it's just a formal argument about the fact that the, the basic, the take home message of complexity is whenever you manipulate a complex system, you will suffer unintended um, side effects. This is the one lesson that humanity right now in late modernity has not understood at all. You tinker with something complex, it'll come back to kick you. Okay? And it happens every time you do this. Okay? That's the only thing that's certain in this uncertain world. So the problem here is, of course, this term congruence. Okay? So we, in our group, had two reading uh, um, groups, two books, uh, Perspectival Realism by uh, Michaela Massimi and The Wonderful uh, Realism for Realistic um, people by Hazuk Chang, and they have very interesting ideas that can be applied to Rosen, surprisingly. So uh, Massimi, I'm not going to go into this, I'm just going to mention it, and I'm also going to mention Marcus Wextrom's beautiful paper on Rosen as a perspectivist that I uh, quote here. Um, so you can interpret this as a formal system being uh, a tool for inference. Okay? So these formal models, they uh, increase our ability to draw inferences about phenomena. That, we see. that would be Michele Massimi's um, argument. Or, even more radical, uh, Hazak Chang argues that these models are just useful. Okay? They allow us to, based on them, the insight we gain from them allow us to act in a coherent way in our environment, in our Umwelt. Not the, or, or in the Umgebung, yeah, if that is a thing, if that exists <laughs> at all. Okay? So, you can actually give Rosen a pretty modern interpretation that is not at all uh, Platonist or uh, abstract, uh, naive, objectivist realist at all. That's, that's the message here. So the slide about Arist Aristotle's causes, I just want to use uh, to make one uh, remark here. And that is, in what follows, it's very important that we get rid of one of Aristotle's main restrictions on contemporary science, and that is the restriction that you shall not have circular causality, okay? So if you look at uh, the Aristotelian idea, his causes are really much more about explanation than about um, uh, physical causation. They're answers to why questions. Of course, you don't want to have circular causation when it's about explanation. You don't want to explain uh, with tautologies, okay? So in an Aristotelian context, it makes all the sense in the world to have a prohibition on circular causation. But Newton takes over this Aristotelian aspect one-to-one, -one, okay, outlawing circular causation. And there is no reason to assume that in the real, in the natural world, in causal entailment, there is no circular causation. 
That is just an un, absolutely unarguable. It's, it's not a tenable assumption, okay? It's not, uh, there's no evidence that this is the case, but all of mechanistic science is based on that assumption. And I'm not talking about material feedback loops. I'm talking about the kind of uh, uh, autopoiesis uh, self-manufacture that I'm going to talk about just now. Okay, so just a little bit more, and I've presented this the last time in November here already, so sorry for those who uh, have suffered through, through this already, but I guess you can uh, do with a quick refresher. So Rosen's epistemology is the following. There's uh, some basic dualisms at the bottom of what we do. If we do science, we have to make a distinction, which is to some point artificial, between us, the inner world, the subjective experience of the world, and what he calls the ambience. The, the, all the rest. This is a complementary set, but you shouldn't, this is, the world is not a set, okay? I just want to say that here. That I'm just using the notation here. It's not clear what this ambience is. It's out there. And so to make clear what the ambience is, we have to use the art of modeling. Um, and that is what science actually is, is uh, to bring the, the outside world inside and to classify, to subdivide the outside world and to classify those subdivisions in a certain way. So a system, in uh, Rosen's terms, is just a collection of percepts that, are, that seem, to us to belong, seem to us to belong together. How much more perspectival can you get than this? Okay, this is the art of modeling. Okay, something seems to belong together, so we make a model of it. And he says, systemhood segregates things that belong together from those that do not, at least from the subjective perspective of a specific self, a specific observer. Okay? No naive objectivist realism here. So we have a natural system, which is part of the ambience, and its environment, which is all the rest with other natural systems as well. And the, the basically the activity of doing science is to uh, subdivide nature into this kind of natural system and that kind of natural system. That's what we're, we're doing, okay? The growth of science as a tool for dealing with the ambience can be seen as a search for special classes of systems into which the ambience may be partitions. And again, this is an art. It depends on relevance realization, which is not formalizable. It is the process of formalization itself, okay, of bringing semantics into syntax uh, to jump the epistemic cut, in the words of Howard Petit, whose work I also heavily recommend if you haven't read it yet. So there are different kinds of systems out there, and this is what Rosen's life itself is really about. So there are mechanisms, okay? And mechanisms are really special systems, is what Rosen is saying. They're not normal. They're not the basic general assumption. They have a largest model. They're, they have a model that tells you everything you need to know about that system with a maximally refined set resolution. Plus, they have a strict separation of state and dynamical laws. This is basically Newton's biggest achievement, although nobody knows that. So he separated the idea of a state, basically a measurement, the initial conditions of a system, with the rules of change, the laws of change. They're separate, strictly separated. And Rosen's argument is basically just this. In organisms, you can't separate those two. Yeah? That's all you have to know about Rosen's argument. It's impossible to separate them, and that's why they're not Newtonian. If you can do this, all smaller models can be derived from the larger models and the other way around. You can build up the largest models from the smaller models and there is always just a finite number of models. There's so much you can know about a mechanism, okay? So this amounts to Newtonian natural law and um, the Newtonian mechanicist asserts that all physical processes are mechanisms. These are the com pan-computationalists um, nowadays. Say, so, oh, everything has to be Turing computable because otherwise it's not physics. That's just bullshit, by the way. I don't know where they came up with this. This is Turing would turn around in his grave. This is not what Turing wanted to say. Actually, explicitly, till his death, argued against his interpretation, physical interpretation of his, of the church Turing hypothesis. This, this is a, a negligence of, they don't know their history, okay? It's just a stupid misinterpretation of what um, Turing, it's a pretty basic misinterpretation of what Turing actually meant on what the theory of computation is about. The theory of computation is about a human activity of calculating stuff. Why would we, monkeys descended from a tree, think the world works exactly like we do calculations? This is absurd, okay? We just recently evolved to do that. And now we think everything in the world has to work this way. It's completely absurd. Okay, so these are dynamical systems. You can formulate them into um, 
differential equations, and this is what we know. This is what I did as a biologist a long time, and then realized it's completely inadequate as a formalism to capture organisms. So Rosen then defines a certain kind of class of mechanisms that are machines. These not only have a largest model, but they have a model that is a mathematical machine, that is isomorphic equivalent to a Turing machine. And that means you can separate hardware and software. This is really, 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 really important. Okay, so they have a, a functional description. These machines have purposes, like organisms. But the purposes are coming from the outside. We impose, you know, whoever created the machine imposes the purpose on the machine. But we can describe the, the parts of the machine in terms of the function. What's also nice is when we build a machine, we usually build it in a way so that functions are localized to specific parts of the machine. Again, organisms are, are not like that at all. Okay, and so this is very practical because if you have localized functions, the machines become fractionable, okay? So you can exactly do this kind of Newtonian separation of state and the, the rules of change. You can formalize this, um, and now I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation from the theory of categories that Rosen realized. And it's that all you need to know, I, I gave an introduction to category theory last, last time I, I spoke here, but all you need to know about category theory is basically this. Usually, the foundation of mathematics is set theory, and that's like the substantivist's idea of mathematics, okay? Sets are backs of things, okay? So you have a substantivist um, basis of all of mathematics, and category theory replaces that with a, a formalism that is based on arrows, morphisms, on process. So basically, it's a processual theory that is meta-mathematical. It describes mathematics itself and is an alternative to uh, set theory as the basis for, for mathematics in general. That's all you need to know. So what we deal with here are just these relational arrows. And since Rosen uses an Aristotelian framework, uh, he says there are two kinds of things happening in a machine. There's an a input-output flow, which is a material flow. And there is a processor, which he calls the efficient causation. A little wrongly, Aristotelians will uh, get very upset about this usually. And I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, so basically, there is a cause that causes the material flow to happen. Um, you can think of some sort of uh, uh, conveyor belt arrangement in a factory. Things are going through. You have uh, parts coming in and a car going out at the other end. Uh, that's the flow from A to B, and F is the whole arrangement of the machines along the way of the, 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 the belt, yeah? The assembly line. But, and this is uh, Rosen's central argument, organisms are natural systems that are not like mechanisms and machines. Mechanisms and machines are simple systems. And they are neither mechanisms nor machines because their efficient causes, the things that entail the process, are themselves caused from within the system. And he calls this uh, closure to efficient causation. This is uh, not exactly the same, but in the same spirit as operational closure or organizational closure in other areas of the theory of life. Okay? And he says uh, systems that have such hierarchical cycles are complex systems. That distinguishes them from simple systems. There, it's not just organisms in that complex system set, but it's ecosystems, economies. Okay, so these are not like organisms. Because organisms are special. They have all of their efficient causes in hierarchical cycles. While the ecology doesn't, the economy doesn't, social system doesn't. Exactly. The problem that we have with our current social system is that it lacks a higher level coherence. It lacks closure completely, okay? So this is an important um, distinction. Okay, so maybe you, you knew all of this, and I apologize um, uh, in advance, but I wanna go through Rosen's central argument very quickly to, to give you the principle of, of this closure and, and the idea of hierarchical cycles. So basically, you can also describe the metabolism of an organism as if it were a machine. That's okay. It's actually okay to use computational models, to use mechanistic models to study organisms because organisms contain mechanisms, but they are not mechanisms. So as long as you take computational models as a tool, it's fine. As, lo as soon as they become a worldview, it's really, really misguided. So basically, now instead of an assembly line, we have a metabolism from, from the food, A, to the products, um, B, of your metabolism macromolecules and, and waste products. Uh, 
guided by the efficient cause. You can think of the efficient cause here as a set of enzymes in, your, in a cell, right, in a living cell. And the problem is the F, the enzymes are themselves not entailed. They are not produced here in this argument uh, yet. So you have to add another mapping, okay? So there's a mapping, you can think of it as the genes, the genome of the organism that replenishes the enzymes when they run out, okay? So you have, again, an efficient cause and a, and a material flow from the product and the, the macromolecules up to the F. And you can go on forever. Then for phi, you need another function. And Rosen argued you get an infinite regress, okay? So you can't solve this. But he found a way, a um, very convenient way of wrapping this last function into the the, 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 um, uh, the diagram itself. So basically, these are different functional components. So you have a metabolic component, a repair mapping, so these systems are called MR systems, and then he uh, invents a map called the replication map, which is inside the system. So this has led to a lot of discussion, but basically, Rosen's conjecture says, if you look at the diagram, what's really important here is that every efficient cause is itself materially caused from within the system apart from the food that's coming in, A, from the outside, okay? So basically, um, this is like the final cause of an organism is simply its totality of efficient causes in Rosen's term. So there's, it's not, he says, this is an interesting argument that people forget about. He says, this is not teleology, it's finality, which is different. It's just the sum of causes and it's in some way circular so that the organism um, constructs itself. All right, this is autopoiesis. It's a formal model of autopoiesis, basically, minus the boundaries. Rosen never bothered really about explicitly including boundaries in his models. And what's really important here is that this is a model of imminent causation, okay? Everything that's important to being an organism is caused from within the organism. This is what Newtonian formalism cannot do, but you can do it in category theory, okay? So that's all you need to know about Rosen's theory for this talk. There's a lot of other good stuff in the book. <laughs> okay, so to go a bit more into this idea of imminent causation. So this is a valid naturalistic form of self-causation. It is against our, the Aristotelian uh, you know, prohibition of, of circular causation that entered into Newtonian formalism. So all functional components are entailed within the system which implies that the material existence of an efficient cause for every functional component of the system, uh, you, you know, so the, the, the existence is implied. It doesn't mean this is a closed system, it's important. You still need food and energy come into this, the system. But the efficient cause, the processor, to, to create that uh, organization comes from within the system. And this implies what we can call self-determination in the uh, uh, Mosio uh, Moreno uh, account or self-sufficiency in the case of Louis in the reflection of life. So uh, this is autopoiesis. This is a formal model of autopoiesis. And the central, this is imminent causation is just mentioned once in Rosen's book, but it's a central concept, okay? It shows you that self-manufacture and therefore agency and norms is not a matter of determinism or non-determinism, causal determinism or non-determinism, although non-determinism helps, it is a matter of circular causal flow that is much more complex than just material feedback loops. Yeah? Material feedback would just be a bunch of uh, empty-headed errors going around in a circle. So closure to efficient causation is a form of organizational closure. As I said before, organizational closure at any particular time, and this is important now, so one criticism I have of most of the theories of life that we have, organizational theories of life, is that they like to present you these kind of diagrams like Rosen diagram, Rosen's diagram before, and sort of intuitively imply to you that organization is something fixed, static, okay? But that's not the case. Organizational closure at any particular time dynamically presupposes earlier organizational closure. The only constraint, the only condition on this system is that the organization leads to further organization. Yeah? Closure needs to produce closure. But you can have any form you want within that, those constraints, yeah? and you will stay alive. Okay? So you can vary quite a bit in the way that you materially achieve this, and you will only achieve it dynamically by changing your, your structure constantly. 
because this is physically achieved through uh, Kaufman's idea of work constraints cycle. So the organism invests work to, to persist. Okay, so that makes it very different from the persistence of a rock. Yeah, you all know that in this, in this room. So component processes of a living system dynamically co-constitute each other by constraining and enabling each other's behavior. And uh, Terry Deacon says this is why the sum is less, uh, the whole is less than the sum of its parts, okay? So the, the processes of your body could do a lot more if they weren't in your body, okay? You constrain them, they're captured, they're trapped in you. And only by working together, by, by massively reducing the degrees of freedom that they have, will they form a coherent whole. Yeah? So the, the whole is less than the sum of its parts. Or I like, uh, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. Okay? So, two major problems with Rosen's approach. First of all, it has nothing um, to say um, about real <laughs> biology. <laughs> so, uh, Rosen himself actually uh, recognized this and wrote quite a bit about it. He called it the realization problem. It's a problem of embodiment. This is not embodiable. Is that a word? It cannot be made to fit the cell. And also, he just forgot about the formal cause in Aristotle. Okay, he never talks about it. It's just efficient material cause and then um, final causes to some of the efficient causes. And so Janni Hofmeier comes in and says, okay, his model is called the FA system for fabrication and assembly. It's a model of self-manufacture. This is basically a formal model of autopoiesis that actually matches what's happening in the biochemistry of the cell. And the trick is, um, you have three processes, okay, and they mutually support and generate each other. The first is macromolecular synthesis, number one in the, the diagram here. The second is the cellular milieu. It's very interesting because it's a system level property um, uh, with chaperones that enable the non-covalent folding self-assembly proteins that has nothing to do with the coding of the genes. So you have to create a certain very specific milieu to get functional proteins. And, of course, transmembrane transporters that um, uh, regulate the traffic. Um, of electrolyte uh, composition of the milieu and also are the products of macromolecular synthesis. So these three processes interact in a dialectical way. We somehow incorrectly uh, called it a trialectic because it's three processes. Okay, it's very Persian. Life is very Persian, by the way. It's always three or something. And uh, this is a, a hierarchical interactions in the sense of hierarchical cycle of Rosen, but it's also a constitutive interaction, okay? It's not just feedback. These processes are building each other, co-constructing as they go along. They emerge together and only together. So you have a problem because they will never get started for the origin of life. This is why the origin of life problem is hard. Okay, so they only, they work once they're going, but they shouldn't get going in the first place. And once they're going, they never stop. That's the sense, trivially, in which they're not computable. They just never terminate. They don't halt. And you can simulate any part of the whole evolutionary process, but if you want to understand life as it is right now, you would have to simulate every relevant detail from the beginning of life until now, which is impossible. Okay? So you will never have a, a complete model of, of evolution like this. And Hofmeier's model can be extracted to a diagram that looks slightly different. I don't want to go into the detail of this, but the, the little diagram on the left on the top is, is, is Hofmeier's um, Rosen diagram. It's the same idea with the arrows and the different components. And you can unfold it, and it has uh, formal causes. What are the formal causes? The formal causes give the efficient causes and the material causes their specific shape. So they are about actualization, about the implementation of the system in the real world. And there, of course, codes, genetic codes. Uh, you know, if you have read uh, uh, Barbieri's code biology, this kind of biosemiotic idea of uh, uh, semantic codes in, in the living organism, they are represented by the formal cause in, in Hofmeier's model. And so this model is open to formal causation. The, 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 this form always changes, okay? And this makes the model uh, suitable for evolution, which is what it wasn't before. So you introduce a notion of variation. Um, again, I want to point out that one of the variables of the model is systems level. So it's irreducible down to the molecular level. So this is not a simple Newtonian structure that's just based on the interaction of parts. And uh, the hierarchical cycles uh, of efficient causes, are uh, they're collectively impredicative. That's the origin of life problem. They never get going until they're already going. So this is really paradoxical. It's, it's a Ouroboros <laughs> process. <laughs> uh, 
so it's it's a snake biting its tail kind of process. And um, uh, my uh, artist collaborator, I can send you the slides if you, if you want. Um, my artist collaborator, Marcus Neistetter, has depicted this this mutual co-construction uh, of autopoiesis in this way. So you have uh, cellular milieu, transmembrane, transporters. And then so in this paper that I was mentioning before, we, we showed that um, this kind of trialectic, as we called it, also happens on other levels. So it happens at the level of anticipation. So basically you have a model of the future, you, you revise it according to your experiences. So you go through the same kind of constructive trialectic and you have it at the ecological level, okay? So this is work with Dennis Walsh, uh, who's also co-author on this paper, um, where you have affordances as the opportunities and obstacles in the environment. Uh, and these are grounded in the relationship of the organism with its umwelt. Um, thanks, Charles, for introducing that before. Um, and uh, you have uh, an umwelt that is basically an affordance landscape. And that's called the arena. This is the relevant part of your umwelt, is the arena in which the agent is active. And the, the, um, what these affordances are depends on the goals of the organism. So you have to have an agent for those to, to exist. As Charles already pointed out before, the umwelt doesn't exist if there's no agent. And uh, an organism's repertoire of actions uh, delimits what goals it can do, uh, pr uh, what it can do in pursuit of those goals. So the, this triad of goals, actions, and affordances themselves show this um, same constitutive dialectic dynamic that is not feedback regulation, but is a, 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 this kind of Rosenian um, dynamic. So, how much time do I have? I'm wrapping up. Five minutes? Perfect. Okay. So, to wrap up. Um, here, I have to show this. This is just Marcus's, Marcus going crazy. Uh, this was published in the paper. So, this figure. <laughs> so, this is the, the trialectic of trialectics. And the basic idea, this is co-constitutive constraint generation, which underlies everything in biology. Organisms invest physical work toward the continued maintenance and manufacture of their own organization. So this is the concept of organizational continuity that's James DeFrisco and Matteo Mossi's work. Because of imminent causation, this behavior originates from within the organization of the organism. And what is relevant to the organism is what it perceives and anticipates to be beneficial for its continued existence. But it may be wrong, as we saw before. These are norms, not laws. But it actively allocates effort and resources accordingly. Um, I think Timothée called this, it treats these uh, as, as important resources. And uh, this yields an obvious naturalistic grounding for the basic norm of survivability because the organism has to allocate resources according to a certain norm, okay? And it has to know, to live is to know, Maturana once said, I think this is uh, a bit confusing. To know here doesn't mean that you're aware of what you're doing, but it means that you've evolved to operate within a certain constraint regime that allows you to maintain this uh, uh, state of life in a given environment, okay? And you do it adaptively. And this notion of adaptation is broader. Uh, it, it combines both the physiological idea of adaptation and the Darwinian idea of adaptation and brings them together. Okay, so, um, the important point here is that all of this precedes, presupposes evolution, okay? Rosen himself writes in this really weird final chapter of his book. <laughs> this is a really strange chapter if you, if you get to it. Uh, so you get to the end of the book and you're rewarded with a, with a really weird rant about evolution. But uh, one thing that he says that's true is, is it is easy to conceive of life and hence biology without evolution. Have you watched Solaris? Okay, how did that ocean evolve? It's just one ocean on a planet, okay, and it got consciousness. How did it do? Okay, I know Solaris isn't real, but it's not impossible, okay? So you don't need individuals for evolution, you just need differentiation between parts, you know, that are sufficiently uh, autonomous of each other. This is an old beef of mine, I'm a paper, I'm gonna write that, so it's, I call it the Solaris paper, I've been meaning to write it for 20 years, I've never, never done it. So you don't need evolution to explain life, but, um, you actually need an organized cell or organism, uh, what I have called in a paper that just came out officially this year, but was actually written three years ago, 
the reproducer based on James Prisma's idea of the reproducer. I should finish. Yeah. Um, this is the last slide. Is the, this is the fundamental unit of embodied evolution in, by natural selection. So you do not get evolution with anything less than a living cell. Okay? So all these simulations that have naked replicators evolving, they are what Howard Petit calls physics-free modeling. Okay? These naked replicator evolutionary scenarios are thermodynamically not impossible. I don't walk into this trap. Extremely improbable. Okay, astronomically improbable to actually work in the real world. The only thing that gives you, the only process that gives you uh, the right kind of variation for uh, evolution by natural selection is a life cycle of an organized cell. Such systems come for free with agency autonomy, with normativity, just as I said before, because they have to invest physical work into specific processes that are caused from within themselves to self-manufacture. So they achieve organizational continuity through imminent causation. Evolution cannot explain the organization of the organism. It is a prerequisite uh, for uh, evolution. Nor can it explain the origin of agency or normativity in living systems. That is an organizational problem. Uh, the origin of life problem is not solvable by evolution. And then the rest is history. Basically, out of this basic survivability, um, this is a rather glib slide. I, I, Please do not ask me about details about this, but I think it's not wrong, okay? It's vague enough to be right. So based on this, from this really basic natural agency and survivability that's present in a bacterium, you get additional um, uh, you know, norms uh, that allow you to flourish and not just to survive and to have values eventually if you're a human being, um, to evolve cognition and then consciousness and free will eventually. Uh, these are gradual emergences that happen later on, based on uh, these, um, this triad of autopoiesis, anticipation, and adaptation that emerges at the origin of life itself. That's it. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Tarja Knutila and uh, Paul and Kevin, who are not here, uh, and the Andrea Lutgers in Vienna, and uh, people like James de Frisco, who have uh, helped me um, not to become a philosopher, but to uh, do actual philosophical work. Uh, and Marcus Neustetter, I'm involved in an arts and science uh, project. Uh, and according to uh, William Irvin Thompson, we call what we do Wissenskunst. We explore the space between arts and science, conceptual art. Um, if you're interested in that, ask me. Um, and so it was really just a very, very rough sketch. But what I'm trying to do here is take some of the concepts you guys historically introduced before and try to make them, connect them to uh, modeling practice in biology. I think this is a really important thing that we need to do. We not only need to rediscover and understand what these people said decades ago, um, but we need to connect people like Kang uh, from Kang to Rosen, to actual biological practice, if we want this to be noticed outside and specifically uh, among the philosophers of biology and the biologists who are actually doing the work in the lab. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much. It's super intense. So um, when it comes to science of plant solaris, I mean that this is quite interesting because you think of this thing in ocean as parasiting on the life of others. Phantoms that hope it can evolve in relation to the problems that people bring to this. Uh, this is not my question. Uh, uh, that's interesting. So, uh, <laughs> uh, this is an interesting conception of God, by the way. It's not some kind of Spinozian God. It's ocean. But anyway, uh, so my question refers to the, to the concept of um, uh, relevance realization. Could you say more about that? Because I have a feeling that this whole talk is somehow built on this concept, yeah. but somehow I got lost. And oh. uh, but at the same time, it rings a bell in my mind because I'm trying to, in my own in, in my own work, I'm trying to do something with the concept of problematization as a kind of let's say more complex cognitive and social capacity to see certain things, mm -hmm. see quote unquote, see certain things as issues, as problems, as opportunities and so on and so forth. And my problem, let's say, is that this is rather costly. 
I mean, you need to put a lot of effort to be able to problematize something, and especially if you if you look at this capacity as a social capacity, yeah, yeah, you yeah. see this that some collectives are capable of problematizing certain relevant things, like certain opportunities, and some others are not. Yeah. Somehow they got stuck in some completely dysfunctional institutional solutions and so right. on and so forth, because they are unable to, to see certain opportunities. So what is the evolution of this capacity and, and how it becomes costly and generally what are your thoughts about it? So the basic, I'm sorry for not introducing this. Uh, so I said the gist of it is basically you have to pick out what is relevant and the problem is that there is no search space. So basically you can't formalize this problem because if you formalize search, uh, you have to have a search space with certain abstract dimensions. Yeah. And those dimensions are parameters that need to be formalized. And to come up with those parameters is an optimization problem itself. So you get an obvious infinite regress. So there is no algorithmic solution to the problem of relevance. And it's just that. It's basically how is an organism. So no algorithmic system, no matter how many parameters an, an AI algorithm has, it cannot do that. Impossible, absolutely impossible to do this. People say, oh, you cannot know, but I can. Yes, you cannot do that. So basically, an organism can do it. Why? Because it cares. Okay, I'm going to use Frankfurt's what we care about um, uh, framework here. Because if you don't care about anything, then nothing is relevant for you. Okay? And so um, it is a gamble in the end. Uh, because there is no algorithmic solution, you cannot solve this problem by search. But basically, it's an evolutionary, and also in, in higher organisms, animals and, and, and humans, of course, a learning process that's also an adaptive. There, there's an adaptive dynamic going on. Sometimes purely Darwinian in a, in a bacterium, but in humans, of course, much more complex than that. But they are related with each other, and um, this is the basis of, of agency, of cognition, of everything. And it cannot be computational. So this is not a hard computational phenomenon because it's to speak with Joseph Weissenbaum it's about judgment and not calculation so you cannot get the kind of judgment you need to do a relevance realization out of any um, uh, calculation computational process and so this is the big question can you formalize this and you can formalize it at, uh, at the level of category theory but the idea is to come up with a dynamical model of the instantiation of an organism and that is the problematic um, step because the, basically you need a set of equations that writes itself. So you have to wrap all the structure of the model into itself. And we do not have the mathematical theory to do that. Although this is contested by people like Josep de Longo with things like lambda calculus and recursive. But recursiveness is just Turing computation. So this goes beyond Turing computation. It's a constructive process that I think has to do crucially with embodiment. You can only get it in an, an embodied, self-constructing system in a physical sense. So it's it's got a lot to do with embodiment and an activism. And, uh, so. I don't know who is first on the Yes, or... Yes, uh, go ahead. OK, well, Joey, thank you. For your talk, I, I, I think I agree with 99%. <laughs> but I know you have the drug uh, conditions and everything, but I have to say, as, as part of the audience, you repeated like 20 times, it's all bullshit, everybody's stupid, nobody knows, it's completely absurd. I mean, I stopped writing, but it's a bit offensive. We might share some of this total bullshit, nobody understands, and it's, you know, Maybe uh, we should shit up a bit because it's, it's, you're, you're not a computation and computationalist. Well, it, it, it doesn't matter. You say so many things that half of which I might fall into the super stupid asshole uh, category. I didn't say that. Well, maybe maybe you don't know what I believe, right? So, for example, Stephen Wolfram, for mm -hmm. example, he's a computation. He's a very smart guy. I appreciate, you know. So the good reasons why monkeys came down from the trees thought that things could be explained with computationalism because it's a very powerful language, more powerful than natural language. And you try to explain everything with natural language, so you are a monkey that you know you can can you follow so it's but like, anyway, just 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 to just to be a bit of you know maybe we can also be wrong and you know it's fine. Um, so I have a couple of questions because I, I went into roles and I have my problems trying to fully understand it. 
And one of them, what would happen if the system is not fully close to efficient concession? Yeah, okay. Just suddenly it wouldn't be alive, something? What? It wouldn't be alive if it's not fully so close? Because closure is either you have closure or you don't have. Yeah, so this is the problem with the static notion of closure, right? So if you're a dynamic process, in a biofilm, you can delegate closure to a, 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 so you get simpoiesis instead of autopoiesis. You get a, a higher level organization, and then you can, of course, some of your internal processes become redundant, and you can delegate this uh, in a symbiosis, uh, especially, for example, in an endosymbiosis or something like that. Right. So this is if you switch to a dynamical view, processual view of organization. This, this problem goes away of either organized or not organized, okay? Because it's then just becoming, it's a shift of level of organization that can happen dynamically. But it has to be organized at a specific level. And also, sometimes... Are you close to efficient organization? Yes, yeah, so you have to maintain, you can have gaps in that, okay? For example, you can be basically a, an organism that is dying, right? Then, no, no, just right now. Yeah. We, we are all are individual. Well, I'm slowly, we're all slowly dying. Yes, but so how about vitamins? Yeah. Are vitamins? So closure is a, a organizational, so it's all, it requires openness to, to energy and material flow. No, but vitamins are not energy or matter. They they are enzymes. They operate like vitamins are the matter that you consume to. Uh, sure, to but I don't know. I don't consume it. But if it goes out of my body. I didn't eating. at lunch, but normally you do. No, <laughs> no, no. But when you are a biologist, you tell yeah. me what vitamins. They are food, they are part of your food. So they come in. They come in. That's the A in, in the, the food. But they come out as they come in. They, right? Uh, they are not metabolized, right? Well, some of them are, but that doesn't matter, right? I mean, well, they are well, not well, used, well. they are used as cofactors and then they're uh, secreted afterwards. So uh, this is all included in this A to B map, right? So you are not a car. You don't have fuel that you combust and you exhaust. You, uh, like Andrea said yesterday, you are what you eat. You, the food becomes you, and the trees outside are your your breath. You know, so this is uh, this is not a problem um, in this uh, uh, closure of efficient causation. It just means that at some level, again, one problem is how do you go from a cell to a multicellular organism in, the, in a, a organizational accounts that are focused on the static idea of organization. But this can happen evolutionarily by, by shift, the dynamic shift uh, in the level of organization. But you have to have uh, closure at some level. Yeah. And then that closure system and closure is the, the um, originator of the norm, the seat of the norm, yeah. and the agency in the sense that if you have them, a hybrid cyborg, we were talking about the cyborg manifesto last night, um, you have technological enhancements, but you're still the agency that comes from your biological system. Okay, but my, my next question, I'm going to close with this. I think we have to talk about vitamins a bit more. But do you think that fundamental physical laws expressed in the dynamical system that are not in category theory, do you think they are complete? No. So uh, we know that, and physicists know that. So the, the best work on this is Howard Petit. I mean, so basically, physics distinguishes strictly between boundary conditions and the actual uh, rules and the parameters inside um, variables of the system. And in this, so if you want to understand living systems, you need to get rid of this distinction, right? So you need to bring the boundary conditions into the system. And again, it's not about closure in material or energetic terms, but in an in a organizational terms, right? So you need to have this kind of, of self-manufacture of cohesion. <coughs> And uh, yeah, so okay. I don't know if that answers your question. No, but if we can have a conversation, I, you know, why am I uh, upset about? I mean, we live in this these computationalized Google transhumanism. Okay, and Google Silicon Valley. Like this confident. is why I'm angry, and nobody in this room, I am confident, is among these people. But they are dangerous. Okay, and they are dangerous in a way that few <coughs> human uh, movements have been dangerous. In we are going to kill ourselves through hubris, and this is why I'm angry at these people. And it's bad philosophy and it's bad science. Organism was very dangerous. No. Yeah, also, uh, theories of life are very dangerous because imagine if we actually create new life. That's maybe not a good idea. What, 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 I, what, what, I agree with you, and we'll talk uh, over beers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like a long discussion. Yeah. Yeah.
just uh, I think Andreas was uh, next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, again, great food for thought. Drink, drink for for the mind. And um, I mean, I want to do my little Keteron Kenzio, as you say in German Latin. Um, so I find this there, there's so many, there's so much inspiration in this and um, in, in everything I could follow. But still, I would say, where is interior experience? Hmm. Where is where is the experience of being alive? Where is this in this moment? And and I mean, to me, if we if we, we, we cannot forego this because this is just fundamental. Yeah. So you have realized that the, the process of life is paradoxical, right? It is because it is has the circularity, and the same way is the the, the relationship between subjectivity and um, uh, objectivity. What I've, I've done here is I've I've done the crime that you accused science of, and I, I I stuck with it, but deliberately. You know, it's a deliberate choice. So as you said, the heart problem only arrives, and I recommend also the blind spot book by Evan Thompson, Adam Franklin, and Marcelo Gleiser, which is a really accessible. Um, introduction to this problem is the heart problem only arrives when you have excluded experience from your epistemology already. Okay, so everything we present, everything we see in the previous talk, we also have this paradox is in our minds, but it, it is not a solipsistic kind of thing because those minds are open to the interaction with the environment. Okay, and this requires a very long answer to your question, but basically, I think. Asking the, the question about the heart problem and, and the nature of subjectivity and expecting answers from a formalistic approach is the wrong way to go. So, I'm not interested. Is the formalistic approach able to explain subjectivity? No. Why should it be? It's not designed to do that. But it can be pushed as far as we can, but it breaks down. It's surprising to me is it breaks down much earlier. So it breaks down in the fact that uh, organisms are not computational or for, you know, processes of formalization. Constant, constantly absorbing semantic and making meaning, uh, basically, like Charles said before, we're me me uh, meaning making, uh, but not machines, <laughs> we're meaning making open systems that metabolize knowledge, really, um, just like we metabolize food. And uh, we have to change our view in biology and in, in, in society in general to, to acknowledge that really urgently. Mm. Therefore, like somewhat passionate and polarizing. Yeah, no, I, mean, uh, I, I actually, I actually really appreciated this. So, so, yeah. and one thing that I still have to say about perspectivism. The good thing about perspectivism is, you know, postmodernism is paradoxical in its nature because the only thing that's certain is that nothing is certain. But perspectivism is not because it's just another perspective, and that's totally fine. So the problem doesn't arise when you have a computational approach. The problem arises when you have what Wimsett calls nothing butism, when you certainly have a philosophy that becomes an ideology, and only this ideology counts. And this is not something I'm doing here. I'm providing a perspective, a framework in which you can use computational approaches and, and, and recognize their limitations. But this is not what's happening out there in biology. It's a mechanistic. Biology is more mechanistic than physics today. And oh, yeah. this is a, a real problem. I think that's yeah. 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 Yeah.